Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have Clive Smith. He's the CEO of Think Labs, and we're talking about a a device they've made called the One Stethoscope. It's uh, supposed to be a super powerful stethoscope that can do many different things in one. So, Clive, thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. You're very busy. You do a lot of podcasts. Yeah, I clumped them together on uh, three days a week, so I get a lot done. But yeah, yeah. It's, you know, I like to learn stuff. So yeah, yeah. So it seems. Tell me about uh, Think Labs and the One Stethoscope. Tell me some of your background. I studied electrical engineering in South Africa. And then I came to the States and uh, did graduate study in uh, electrical engineering at Caltech and studied electronics and signal processing, both. And um, Think Labs came out of essentially a few things. One was that I always wanted to uh, be an independent entrepreneur anyway. And there was always something that I wanted to do from a lifestyle point of view and from a innovation point of view. I was interested in developing innovative products that uh, I came up with. And uh, so I started Think Labs and the name originally was a sort of general name for being able to think of interesting ideas and interesting problems to solve and then getting in the lab and figuring them out and producing products out of it. So that was the- how, How long have you been doing this and how many products have you come out with? So I started in the early 90s, and in the first few years, I was doing, or for many years, actually, I was actually doing projects that involved, you know, other companies, and people were coming to me to essentially look into problems that they had and that they were looking to do. And I, somewhere in the mid-90s, I encountered the problem of stethoscope sound, and the encounter was essentially, I found a, uh, came across a research article in a cardiology journal that described the stethoscope as having essentially the same sound since it was invented in 1816. And so here was this device, which is the single most common medical diagnostic device in use even today. And it hadn't changed since it was invented, you know, 200 years ago. So having that analog electronics and electronic design and signal processing background, I decided that it was going to be a slam dunk to produce a much better stethoscope and be able to produce much better audio. So heading out to do this problem, and I had always been interested in medical electronics anyway, even as an undergraduate student, I had done research on medical devices. So I always had a kind of an inclination towards solving medical problems. So I thought this was going to be a slam dunk. I got on with it and lo and behold, after eight years, I put a product on the market, uh, the first Think Labs electronic stethoscope. So it was actually a very non-trivial problem. It's very challenging to actually extract sound with very high quality out of the human body. So what I thought was going to be quick was turned out to be an eight-year research and development project. So what other background sounds, in addition to the heart, uh, do you want to eliminate or do you want to discover? I mean, if you increase the, uh, the sound that's harvested, you might hear things that never were heard before. Well, exactly. So that's, uh, you know, the thing about innovation, uh, you know, and, you know, using your, the title of your, uh, you know, Finding Genius podcast is that things are very much a matter of timing as well and the environment that one is in and the times that one lives in. So to the point of hearing things or detecting things that you know might otherwise not be detected, that's actually sort of emerging now, all these years later. So we came out with a stethoscope. The first stethoscope was in you know, 2003, 2004 timeframe. And Today, we've now got machine learning, artificial intelligence, 
signal processing has developed further and the possibility of detecting and extracting signals from the heart and from the lungs and sounds and from other organs in the body and actually interpreting them and figuring things out that doctors didn't know or didn't know in the signals you know this is the time basically to do it from now going forward so originally the idea was amplify the sound make it much easier to hear the heart make it much easier to hear the lungs and doctors have had 200 years of training and experience in being able to identify signals. So they know what heart murmurs sound like. They know what a, what a leaky valve in the heart sounds like. They know what various kinds of wheezes and crackles and diseases of the lung sound like. So there's this 200 years of pattern recognition by doctors, which is handed down by a kind of an oral tradition because it's very hard to teach. So they hand this down from generation to generation over 200 years, and they teach doctors how to listen. Well, there's a very inefficient way to teach. It's, an in, it's a very difficult skill to learn because it's learned by experience. And as medical technology advanced, there was less and less time to practice and learn this particular art, this particular skill. And other modalities of diagnosis started emerging like echocardiography and other imaging technologies, which sort of made doctors feel like they don't need to rely on the stethoscope the way they used to when they really had nothing but a stethoscope. So the opportunity to now detect signals, so the, the human ability to detect interesting signals from the human body has actually decreased as we've gone forward. And the doctors today are not actually as skilled as doctors were, say, 40 years ago, because they don't need to be, they can rely on other testing schemes and testing methods are coming along and machines can now be put into service to try and find the signals. And, you know, we assume that the machines or we believe that the machines will be able to um, extract the kinds of diagnoses that doctors were able to extract, but there are likely to be sounds and signals which were not recognizable to the human ear, which were either much too quiet or they were much too subtle or the correlations were difficult to, to make. And so machines, you know, can be expected in the next few years to extract what doctors use stethoscopes for, but also to actually find new signals that we weren't aware of. I guess it's like a car mechanic that could listen to a car and tell you what's going on. And now they don't, or they can't because they have all these tools. But um, one thing I could see, I don't know if the, the, the product does this, but to record the sound and to put it into the patient's file into their electronic health record would be great. So you have that, it could be listened to later and you could build a, a huge collection of heart rate sounds and then use AI to train on it to get even better at figuring out what are they, what's it listening to. Right, exactly, yeah. So that's, you know, we're at the beginning of that, of that kind of evolution. Um, it's just starting to occur uh, there have been some early developments which are, you know, not in not in really in much clinical use at this point. Um, so this this is what lies ahead is to do all these kinds of studies. So there's going to be, you know, there's going to be some rich data to mine there, um, and we're at the beginning of that journey. Well, so far, what have you been able to hear that wasn't heard before? What can you tell about the um, heart murmur? I mean, what can you tell from the uh, the beating sound? So, so we're not allowed to make claims um, publicly that have not been approved by the FDA. So we're very cautious about saying anything in that regard because it's actually against the law to make diagnostic claims. So, um, so I would rather err on the, on the side of caution in terms of, you know, what we know. Um, however, at the, you know, at the most basic level, doctors are able to hear things much more clearly and at a louder decibel level than they were before. So sounds that were really difficult to detect um, are easier to detect, but we are, you know, we, we're not inclined at this point to say, oh, you can now hear this or that particular pathology, which was never heard before. Well, can you say what you hope to hear? Um, I think that we can expect to hear the earlier stages of phenomena earlier than they were detected with a normal, regular old stethoscope. I think that we could get ahead of disease 
um, and anticipate things better and pick things up earlier. I think that there's the potential to do that. And so we could essentially be able to detect things where we can head things off because the earlier you treat certain things, the better. And also there are earlier treatments for a lot of things where, you know, one of the questions that always comes up with diagnosis is, is there anything actionable about it? You know, if you knew this, it would it make any difference to the management of a patient. And so, there, you know, you know that's, a, that's a moving target as well, because there were diseases like valvular heart disease, the heart valves. Basically, you know, you needed to have a really, 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 you know, bad condition in order for an intervention to be justified. But the threshold for intervention now for a cardiac problem is much lower than it used to be. So what that does is that it potentially moves, you know, it sort of moves things forward in terms of, well, if I can detect this earlier, I can take action earlier. So there's, there've been changes in, in, you know, in, in whether, you know, any information is, is more actionable than it used to be. So the combination of being able to act on a disease more quickly and head things off earlier, and then the ability to detect things earlier that combination is is actually quite powerful. Are there other sounds in addition to the heartbeat that you think may be useful to listen to? Putting the stethoscope in another on the stomach or other areas, you know, besides hearing a growl. Yes. You think uh, there's anything else? Yeah, you know, that's actually an interesting question. So the, you know, the primary area that um, that heart and lungs have been, you know, that that the stethoscope's been used is for heart and lung. Um, the stomach offers some interesting opportunities as well. Uh, we're early in that kind of investigation, so we don't yet know what it'll offer, but uh, there could be some quite interesting things in that area too. So I would say that we would be looking at heart, lungs, and gastric sounds primarily. Um, but you know, one could, you know, once you've got AI and you can collect data you can start to look for other correlations. So there could be other things that come up, you know, that could actually provide some interesting information. You know, is there information in the way the joints sound in, in the human body? Is there something that we could detect quite easily without doing an X-ray? I'm not saying we will you, be able you, to do that or we can do that. All I'm saying is that there are other things that, you know, might just not have even been on the radar, which could come up in the future. Yeah, you might actually be able to do kind of a stress test. You know, if I if I put this device on you and I said, all right, Clive, think of, um, you know, a really scary thing that happened to you. And then I see what happens to your heart and how it sounds. And then I say, all right, Clive, you know, think about like, you know, one of your happiest memories. And then I, you know, have you listen to, I don't know, some relaxing music and you relax. Maybe I exercise you a bit. And again, I listen to how your heart slows down or how it sounds like when it beats fast. I mean, there could be like a whole, set of non-invasive diagnostics done with sound with the person in different conditions. Right. Where I wonder what you could tell. Well, I think that that's where machine learning comes in is that you can do a lot of experiments and data collection and you can see where it goes. So I think that there's a, you know, it's quite a rich field that has not been explored. And at the moment, they're all the, you know, the, the sort of the usual suspects, like I say, you know, things related to cardiac and pulmonary that are, being investigated. But I think that as time goes on, we'll get more and more investigators looking at interesting things. And, you know, pretty much anyone who's doing anything related to these kinds of sounds comes to talk to us. So we get to have some very, very interesting conversations. Um, unfortunately, you know, a lot of them are under confidentiality agreements or, you know, they're university researchers who are looking into certain, you know, novel ideas and things like that. So we honor their confidentiality, but, you know, you're on the right track. You're on the right track. Basically, there could be a significant opportunity to discover all sorts of things related to, you know, a person's psychological state, uh, the body's reaction to various situations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the challenge is to collect the data. The challenge is to actually collect enough data that you can you can put this into a machine learning algorithm and you can try and find correlations and you can try and see whether there are patterns that emerge. Because that's really what, what 
you know, auscultation or using a stethoscope has been about for 200 years. It's been pattern matching, basically. I hear a sound. This sound is correlated with that. Do I have a physiological basis for arguing that this particular sound is correlated with that? Yes, it makes sense. And then they use pattern recognition. So there's been human pattern recognition basically has been the fundamental use of this tool for 200 years. So, you know, certainly there's a lot of opportunity for the future. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Yeah, what if you overlay an EKG with the sound component? Or what if this was integrated into halter monitors in the future? So not only are you getting the actual readout, the electrical readout of the heart, but you're getting the sound. And then you look for, um, you know, consistency there or, or departures there. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Hmm, very, very cool. So uh, where are you at in the development of this device? Like what was to be done? Do you have clinical trials ahead or like how far along are you? So we've had stethoscopes in the market since, as I said, late in 2003, early 2004 was around the time that we started releasing our first product. And so we've been in the market for about 17 years and we're well established. And so, you know, we're not a you know, startup in the classic, you know, sense from the point of view of, you know, we're, you know, we've got some promising technology and we're getting FDA approval and we're just about to release something. We're way beyond that. We're, you know, we're in wide use. Um, and, you know, we're used for normal clinical medicine as an, you know, amplified device that people can hear things more clearly. We're used in telemedicine, which has now suddenly become a common term since COVID. People have suddenly started realizing that telemedicine is extremely convenient and has a lot of benefits. So we've been in that market for, you know, probably five years or so and, you know, very active for the last five years. And, um, you know, got into it earlier than that. So our device is in widespread use in that respect. Um, so we also got very involved in uh, infectious disease and protecting healthcare workers. And that started back in 2014 during the Ebola outbreak. So we got very involved in, in how do you use a stethoscope with PPE? How do you protect a healthcare worker and not infect a healthcare worker when they need to listen to a patient? How do you care for patients without infecting the doctor? We got involved in all that sort of thing in 2014. And so when COVID came along, uh, we were basically had already built our experience. We'd already built a lot of relationships with infectious disease departments and they came to us and things just exploded in terms of the demand for the product in order to protect the healthcare workers. And whereas Ebola had been very contained, certainly there were only a, you know, a few cases in the United States that came in from Africa and it was, you know, it was within a certain areas in Africa, you know, COVID obviously is a whole different story and it's global and the demand for our product just completely went off the charts. Uh, in March, we, we had to ramp up production we had to scale overnight, literally. We just had to just, you know, multiply our production in order to meet the demand. And what we found was that we essentially had been all these years working out how we could help patients and save the lives of patients by helping doctors detect disease. And when COVID came along, we found that we were actually a device to actually save the lives of the doctors and the nurses. So, um, yeah, I can see if you use like a Bluetooth mechanism, you could, uh, you know, give a little receiver module to a patient and they could hold it against themselves and then you could just listen remotely. And exactly. then, you know, that could be cleaned and the next person comes in and you don't ever have to go near them. At least, Right, the exactly. The, the stethoscope has got a long history, but it also has a long history of being known to carry um, pathogens. Stethoscopes carried from patient to patient, room to room are well known actually as being um, vectors for carrying disease. And so essentially using a stethoscope, using a conventional stethoscope or anything that looks like a conventional stethoscope is basically, you know, just asking for trouble in a situation like this during the time of COVID. So our device is doesn't look like a, a normal stethoscope. It's basically a small round, you know, sort of semi-cylindrical device and it fits in the palm of your hand and you can just plug in a Bluetooth transmitter and you can put it into a small Ziploc bag and you can apply to the patient through the Ziploc bag 
and the stethoscope is completely clean. And you could then, you know, with a Bluetooth transmitter inside the bag, you could transmit that to wireless headphones, to loudspeakers, to, you know, wireless headphones, Bluetooth headphones outside the room. So what, you know, what doctors and, and emergency rooms have been using our device for, for example, is just have, for instance, the nurse go in and be with the patient. The nurse can hold the stethoscope on the patient and be with the patient. And the doctor can actually remain outside. And the doctor doesn't have to put on PPE. The doctor doesn't have to waste PPE. And the doctor can move from room to room to room much, much quicker because all they're doing is that they can actually stay outside the room. So there are all sorts of benefits to using our device. And, you know, what we decided to do was in, you know, when we came out with our uh, newer model uh, a few years ago, we decided to completely break the, the form of the stethoscope and not go with something that looks like a conventional stethoscope because a conventional stethoscope has got all that tubing and all these other things which essentially can get contaminated. What do you say is ahead in the next few years for the device? I think it's going to essentially become more ubiquitous. There are going to be different applications. As I said, telemedicine you know, has already been growing. So the stethoscope is going to make the leap into different places, different locations where it can be used remotely. And that com- you know, combined with uh, artificial intelligence and automated diagnosis, that's what the future looks like. So you can visualize essentially an intelligent stethoscope that can go almost anywhere, be almost anywhere and be monitoring a patient and provide the sort of intelligent monitoring of a doctor without having to need the doctor you know, so it could essentially be an early warning system. And when the intelligence stethoscope picks something up, it can then alert the doctor. So that's what the future looks like for stethoscopes. Well, very good. Clive, what's the best way for people to find out more about one stethoscope if they have a practice or if they're just curious, you know, where can they go? Yeah, so our website is thinklabs.com. That's think as in using your brains and labs as in the plural for laboratories. So thinklabs.com is our website. Excellent. Well, Clive, thanks for coming. And it's a really, really cool product that you're working on. And uh, it could have many uses, which we will find out about in the future. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. Nice talking to you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.